what I hope is going to stay a lovely spring day. Um, we're going to put on a display for you now that will last about half an hour and hopefully by the end of it you'll have a much better idea what all those different types of armoured vehicles you can see inside the museum, what they're there for, what their role is on the battlefield and we'll tell you a bit about what the crews are up to inside the vehicles as well. But before we begin our display, the inevitable health and safety notices. Um, during the course of the display, the vehicles driving around, they do pump out a fair old bit of smoke. We've had some rain, so it's dampened our track down. There's not an awful lot of wind at the moment, but do watch it if that smoke heads in your direction. Um, watch the kids' eyes, watch your sandwiches, your ice creams if you've got them out. Now, during the course of the display, there will be some very loud pyrotechnic bangs. I warn you about that now. If you're a particularly nervous disposition, this isn't the show for you. So some very loud bangs coming unannounced during the course of the display. And finally, should for any reason we have to call an emergency, we will be asking you all please to walk out of the arena, go to the far side of the car park, gather your group together there, make sure you can account for everybody, and please wait over there for further instructions from us. Please don't do the obvious thing, jumping in the car to try and leave the site, that may cause us more problems at the time. So far side of the car park, gather everyone together and wait for further instructions. But we hope we don't have any issues like that today. Now, we're going to start off our display by uh, bringing on for you a range of armoured vehicles that the military uses. And the very first one we're going to bring on doesn't look that impressive, it's relatively small, but it's very important on the back of got things like spy satellites in the sky, unmanned drones that can send back CCTV pictures. Still one of the best forms of information is someone on the ground radioing back exactly what they're seeing. And to do that, we have vehicles like this. Now, we might call a vehicle like this a scouting vehicle. The military tend to call them reconnaissance vehicles. Um, they're there to gather information. They're not really there for doing the fighting. They're there for finding out as much as they can, radioing that information back to the main force commander, and then basically getting out of trouble as quickly as they can. They don't want to hang around too long. And that's why you tend to have reconnaissance vehicles that are fast, so they're nice and speedy on the battlefield. The quicker you are, the less chance there is of the enemy training their guns on you and knocking you out. Small, again, you're a smaller target. And in this particular case, as a reconnaissance vehicle, this one's called a Lynx, and it was made by the Canadian. You can see it's, it's a tracked vehicle. Now, there's pros and cons about tracks and wheels. Tracks on the whole can go to places that wheels can't get to. The whole idea of those tracks is to spread the weight out of a big heavy vehicle, which otherwise in soft ground it would sink. Wheels are good in the sense that they're quieter than tracks. Tracks make a lot of noise, um, but they won't quite get you to the same sort of places as a track vehicle can go. So in the military, there's often a debate, what shall we have? The British Army in the past has had wheeled reconnaissance vehicles. At the moment, we've got a tracked one. This particular vehicle was made by the Canadians and it was sold to a number of countries. Belgium's country still uses it. It's a small tracked vehicle. So as I said earlier, it can go to one or two places those wheeled vehicles can't get to. Inside this vehicle, there's a crew of three. Driver, you can see, he's got his head out of the hatch at the moment. If he comes under fire, he drops his seat down and he looks through glass periscopes out the front of the vehicle. Now, inside the museums, you can look through some of those periscopes. Whole idea there, of course, if a bullet or a bit of shell hits the glass, it may crack it, but nothing comes inside the vehicle to wound the crew members or damage the vehicle at all. He's got a quick release button on the side of each periscope, out drops the old broken one, in goes a new one, and off he goes again. The downside of periscopes is like looking at the world through a glass fish tank. It tends to distort the outside world, and that's why you'll always see armoured vehicle drivers and commanders. They often leave their heads out the hatch until the last possible moment going into action, because the honest truth is, in most armoured vehicles, when you close all the hatches, your visibility of what's going on outside is really poor. And in many modern vehicles, they're now fitting video cameras all around the outside of the vehicles to give the guys inside better sense of what is immediately going on around the vehicle. 
Now you can see it's got a thumping great machine gun on the front of this vehicle, 50 calibre Browning machine gun that's called, it's an old machine gun, it was made just after the First World War, many armies still use it because it's so effective. Um, that'll put a bullet, it's about, uh, they call it a half inch bullet, it's like a slug of metal, if they fire that at one end of your car it'll quite happily go through your car, through the engine block and out the other end. It's got an awful lot of welly behind it and in the military if things work there is a tendency you hang on to it rather invent the wheel all the time. On this vehicle, honest truth is, it's really there for a bit of moral support for the crew. If this vehicle bumps into the enemy, you don't want to be hanging around fighting it out with them, that's for the tanks coming up behind you. You just need to quick burst of machine gun fire, keep the enemy soldiers heads down and you back off quick. And it's got great mobility to allow you to do that in this vehicle as well. So driver's in the front, commander sits with that, where that round hatch that's open, he's got the binoculars, he's seeing what's going on all the time, and he tells all that to the radio operator, who's the third crew member inside the vehicle, who sends all that message back to the main force. Now the armour plate on this is made of aluminium to keep it nice and light, not very thick, it'll stop a bullet but not much else. So again, you're not really hanging around on the battlefield at all once you've done your job of finding out the information. this vehicle, as many in the museum, you'll see all those things like pickaxes, shovels, tow ropes, they're often carried on the outside of the vehicle. Other things on the vehicle, those little stubby tubes you can see on the front wings, you'll see them on turrets, on tanks, lots of uh, armoured vehicles, vehicles can, carry yeah. a smoke grenade. And the idea is if this vehicle comes under attack or is fired at, it can fire a pattern of smoke grenades out in front of the vehicle, big smoke green builds up very, very quickly, and you can manoeuvre, retreat, reposition yourself, do whatever you need without the enemy seeing you. So again, it's a very useful feature that a lot of armoured vehicles carry with them. Now. Another vehicle that looks almost the same, doesn't it? But again, very different role, this vehicle, on the battlefield. This vehicle coming on now, this is what the military would call an APC, or Armoured Personnel Carrier. Now if you've seen inside the museum on our trench display, there's the last remaining Mark I First World War tank there. The whole idea of that tank in the First World War was to drive across the battlefield, across no man's land, crushing down the barbed wire, letting our infantry follow on behind and getting into the German trenches without getting held up and massacred on the wire by machine gun or artillery fire. Now by the Second World War, armoured vehicles are doing many more things very quickly. So they start building armoured personnel carriers to bring the infantry forward. Now in the back of this armoured personnel carrier, they're going to give you a wave now, we've got some volunteer infantry. We picked out the audience a bit earlier on. We've given them a helmet, we've given them a gun and a uniform, and a bit later in the display, they're going to show you how an armoured personnel carrier like this might be used in a combat situation. Now this vehicle was designed after World War II for the British Army, it's called FV-432, sometimes vehicles get lovely names to them, sometimes they get lumbered with their production number, FV-432, Fighting Vehicle 432, and it was designed in the 60s, really it's a box of metal on tracks to take the infantry forward to where the fighting is, and once they're there, they don't fight from inside the vehicle, they jump out the door at the back and finish the attack on foot. Um, they often call these in the military battle taxis. It's for taking you where the fighting's going on. Now the 432, very reliable. Uh, it's been in service a long time. It's still in service to this day with the British Army. Like many armoured vehicles, you don't actually ditch them and get rid of them entirely. What you do is you send them back to the factories and they get rebuilt. So the new versions of this are called Bulldog. They've got new engines, new gearboxes. When they go off on campaign, they have lots of extra armour bolted on the outside. But underneath it all is quite often there's a vehicle that is probably about twice the age of the young soldier who's serving in it. So they often with armoured vehicles, they're in service a long, long time in the military. So again, you've got the driver in the front, 
commander sits behind, hatches again open, of course they'd close those, those smoke discharges you can see just above the headlights on the front, and the door when it moves off you'll see at the back, that's where they enter and exit. And it's such a simple vehicle, they often used it for many other roles as well, rather than just carrying infantry, some were made into ambulances, some were command posts, engineer equipment was carried in the back, all sorts of things, because it's again, it was a reliable and a relatively simple vehicle to produce, so we actually made a lot of them for the British Army. Now the main armoured personnel carrier used by the British Army these days, we still use a 432, but the main one is actually a bigger vehicle called the Warrior. And they call that an IFE, an infantry fighting vehicle, because the guys inside can actually fight from inside the vehicle. It's got a turret on the top with a cannon in, so they, uh, it can actually fight as well as just deliver soldiers. And the Warrior is a much bigger and much more powerful vehicle. Um, the engine in the Warrior is actually a starter motor from a destroyer. So it can belt that vehicle around the battlefield as quickly as possible to deliver the troops to where they're needed and the faster you are as I said earlier quite often that's a defense in itself the quicker you can move around the less chance the enemy are going to have of knocking you out but we'll see our 432 in a little while in the display with our um, volunteer infantry in the back Now another one of those vehicles that we tend to overlook, but for its supplies forward. And to do that, you need vehicles like this. This vehicle is what they call an M548, Model 548 supply vehicle. And it was originally made by the Americans, but uh, lots of countries around the world bought it and used it. This one was used by the British Army in the first Gulf War for carrying, resupplying its anti-aircraft missiles, uh, resupplies to the batteries in the front line. And uh, why these vehicles are so important as a track vehicle, we all know the Army's got lots of big trucks with massive wheels. But if it's a tracked vehicle has gone across the battlefield, it may have got to places the wheeled vehicle just can't get to. And if those tanks or armoured vehicles need to fight the following day, they're going to need all those things that we know armies need, things like food for the troops, ammunition for the guns, fuel to keep the vehicles going. An army uses a huge amount of fuel. Give you some idea, one of the bigger main battle tanks driving around our arena here, one lap is about a gallon of fuel. So you're going to need an awful lot of fuel to keep that force going. And that's why you need vehicles like this. This is like a force transit on tracks to bring those supplies up to where the fighting's going on. So it's got a flatbed in the back, you can load up with the supplies, crew are in the front, tracks underneath for that mobility. And what we've done, when the British Army got rid of a number of these, we took them down here at the museum, we've actually put bus seats in the back of them. So if you fancy having a go what it's like bouncing around in the back of a track vehicle, this will be running throughout the rest of the afternoon from down in the far corner there till about quarter to four. So um, health and safety, I have to say, I have to remind you, you've got to be over a metre tall, I'm afraid, to have a go in it. But it uh, does give you a good idea idea what it feels like in a track vehicle. And those tracks, how tracks work, we often see them, but do we actually know what's really going on? The whole idea of the tracks, as I said earlier, is to spread the weight out, and the only two wheels that are being powered by the engine on this vehicle are the ones at the front with the teeth in. And the idea is, is you're laying down your own roadway, that's a track, you bite into that roadway and pull yourself along it. The wheels that are on the ground, as it were, they're not actually powered at all. They're just spreading the weight out of that big heavy vehicle across the track. The wheel at the back on each side is just keeping the track nice and tense so it doesn't flop off. So you lay down your own roadway, bite into it, pull yourself along it and pick it up and throw it forward again. And they've got the ground pressure under those tracks lighter than the ground pressure under your feet on some vehicles. Famously in the Falkland Islands, 
a little light scorpion tank drove across a frozen bog. He was absolutely fine. The commander jumped out the side of the vehicle and he fell straight through the ice because the ground pressure beneath his feet was greater than that underneath the, the tracks of the tank. That's how clever they are at spreading weight out. And it means, as I keep saying, you can go to places you wouldn't normally be able to get to. Now the driver in the front of the vehicle has two steering levers, he doesn't have a steering wheel. Like most track vehicles, if you want to turn left, you pull the left lever back, it breaks the track, it slows the track on the left hand side, the other side keeps going and it pushes you round the corner. So if you want to turn right, you pull back on the right lever, come to a dead halt, you pull back on both levers together and that will slow you right up to a halt. Downside of it, you're going to wear out brakes very quick. They go round it like the edge of a 50pp, so it's a straight line, pull on the lever, change the angle of the vehicle, another straight line, another pull on the lever. Now, proper tank at last, I hear you say. Right, this one, this is what we recognise, isn't it, as a big armoured vehicle and a proper tank. This particular one coming on now, this is a tank that was made after World War II by the Americans, and it's called the M60, Model 60, 1960, it first went into production. Uh, and it's one of those tanks that dates back to that period we know of now, of the Cold War, when we thought the East was going to fight the Western nations. Now all the NATO countries, that was really all the capitalist Western European countries in America, we knew in the West that we would never be able to make as many tanks as the Eastern Bloc countries, mainly led by Russia, were making. They had thousands and thousands of tanks. We knew we couldn't match them in terms of numbers, so we tended to go for quality and better technology on our vehicles and that was reflected in this tank. This is, as you can see, it's a massive great lump of metal. This is the last generation of tank that was made out of steel. Modern tanks, you think they're made of metal, actually what quite often you're looking at is a skin on the outside of the vehicle and under that skin there's very clever laminate armours. In other words, things made of different things together, sometimes ceramic, sometimes rubber, sometimes metal, all sandwiched together and that can stop rounds better than the equivalent weight and thickness of steel. This is the last generation where you've got really big, just thick metal trying to stop the rounds that are being fired at it. In that turret on the top there, you've got a crew manning the gun there of three. There's a fourth crew member who's a driver who's right down the front underneath the gun. In the turret, there's a commander, obviously in charge of everything, looking for where the enemy are, radioing down to the driver what's the best way forward, you're higher, you can see things sooner and also picking out targets for the gunner. The gunner sits in front of him, he's the guy with the sights for that big 105mm gun and he's the one who's telling him where to point and what's the most pressing target, in other words what's the biggest threat that you need to take out first of all. On the other side of the turret is a loader and if you ever have to pick a tank crew for yourselves, always pick your loader, someone who's short, stocky, built like a Russian shot putter, because the loader needs to be very fit and very strong, because he's picking up these massive great 105mm rounds, putting them in the breech of the gun to fire them off. And the rate of fire of this tank will go down as a loader gets worn out. So you need someone who's really up to the job. Preferably nice and short as well, because you can imagine there's not an awful lot of room in that turret. Driver's down the front, he's almost lying on his back driving the tank because the lower he is, the lower the gun can be, the lower the turret is and then you're less of a profile, uh, in other words there's less for the enemy to see on that tank. Massive great diesel engine in the back, uh, very thick armour and the Americans actually made a lot of these tanks. Nowhere near the similar numbers of the Russian tanks, but they did make a fair old few. And again, they're still in service all around the world, and like 
I said earlier, lots of armoured vehicles, you can get upgrades for them. You buy all the super duper add-ons, new weapon systems, extra armour to put on the outside, new engines for the back, new transmissions to make it go faster. Um, and that's a, a common thing that happens with lots of armoured vehicles nowadays. Now you can see it's got a jazzy camouflage scheme for the Middle East. The gun on this, I've said it's called it 105mm. We often see that figure, the different figures on front of the size of the guns. It's the size of the hole at the end of the barrel. So 10.5 centimetres across 105 millimetres. And this type of gun, when you were firing at another tank, you don't fire a bullet shaped round like we used to coming out of pistols or rifles. If you're firing another tank at this generation, you actually fire a piston out the end of the barrel. The piston falls away, the sides of it fall away when it leaves the barrel, and it leaves about a 13 inch long metal dart flying towards the enemy tank at supersonic speed. One of the fastest things on earth. And that metal dart at the back of it, it's got little fins on it, just like a dart you'd throw at a dartboard to keep it straight in flight. No explosive on it at all. It's made of dense metal like tungsten or depleted uranium, which is a waste product from the nuclear industry, and just the sheer kinetic energy, in other words, the sheer welly behind it, will smash its way through an enemy tank, quite often all the way through and out the other side. And it leaves one hell of a mess behind it. Very accurate gun as well. This gun, even though it's an American tank, was actually made by the British. We had it on our Centurion tanks. Tremendously accurate, very powerful, so the Americans put it on their tanks as well. Lots of countries still use it. So all in all, it was a very successful tank. Um, it does see action around the world, but as we know, the Cold War, East versus West, never became a hot war. So a lot of these tanks, they did their job just by sitting out in Germany, making sure nothing ever kicked off. And uh, fortunately, we're all here today, because um, frankly, if it had it kicked off, probably we wouldn't be here today. Now, we're going to get the driver to drive the tank off now, um, and you can just hear how noisy a big battle tank like this is. So tank crews are taught to keep their tanks hidden from the enemy. They're bound to hear them coming. So you'll use the map to hide behind things and keep yourself away from being seen by the enemy to the last possible moment. One of the other things you can see from that tank driving around, tanks have a psychological impact as well as their sheer firepower. If you can imagine you're an infantry soldier sitting in a trench somewhere, hearing that coming towards you, you've got to be a very stoic sort of fellow to let that come on. There is a... Boring, uh, but I am not that boring. Can we do that one again, please? Are you all on holiday? Thank you. So in other words, you probably didn't do this morning what you would have done if you'd been back at home, like turn on the breakfast news or look at your daily paper. Because if you did, you would have seen the very disturbing news that last night down at Lulworth, the Ruritanian army landed. And we know they're heading this way to capture this very important mound with the Union flag behind me. Now, if any of you big kids or small kids see the Ruritanians coming, big black flag, skull and crossbones on, they're the baddies heading this way, okay? To one panto. Oh. Right, here they come. These are the bad guys, right? The Ruritanians. Now... The Ruritanians, apart from being a very ugly lot, they're very clever. Because like lots of countries nowadays, they don't make their own tanks, they buy them from someone else. And this tank they've got here is a really good tank. 
This is the tank the Germans made after World War II when they were allowed to make tanks again in the early 1960s. And the Germans said, right, we're not going to build a tank like the Tiger or the King Tiger, massive tanks with thick armour, very slow, big guns. They're going to build a fast tank. And that's what they've got here, the Leopard tank. So on that tank, you can hear it, it's got a thumping great big, what's called an MTU diesel engine at the back. So it powers that tank around really, really quickly. It's got relatively thin armour on the tank. Again, a really good gun. That's that 105mm British gun again, the same we saw on the American M60. We sold it to the Germans as well. And this becomes a tremendously good tank. Lots of countries buy it, including evidently the Ruritanians. Yeah, what do we think of him? Thank you. All right, get on with it. Don't milk it. Go on, off you go. So, the, yeah, the Leopard, fantastically good tank, and lots of countries around the world bought it um, because it was so effective and very reliable as well. Now, he's taken him a while, but he's found the position and he's taking down our flag there. Right, so, he's captured the position. Well done, yes, thank you, Ruritanians. Now, a tank always has its thickest armour on the front, so you always tend to point your tank at where you think you're going to be attacked from, so you've got the best protection. So evidently, the Ruritanians think they're going to be attacked from down the far end of the field. Now, let's see if you were paying attention earlier on. Just imagine the British Army are going to come and capture this position back from the Ruritanians. What's the first thing that armoured commander is going to want to do in a situation like this? What's the first thing he needs to do before he sends his tanks off into the attack? Who was paying attention? Make a cup of tea? No, we're talking about the Army, not the RAF. Come on. Right, someone's paying attention. They'd send out their reconnaissance vehicle, wouldn't they? Because they need to know, first of all, where the enemy are, what's the best way of getting at the enemy, will the bridges hold the weight of a 70-ton tank? No point you driving up the road and collapsing the bridge and you don't even get to where the enemy is. So all those things can be done by the reconnaissance vehicle in advance. So there's our Lynx reconnaissance vehicle working its way forward, radioing back all that information, he can also call down artillery fire on the Ruritanians. Keep their heads down. Don't let them settle. Don't let them get relaxed in their position. And again, all that information goes back to the main force commander. The army has a phrase, time spent on reconnaissance is rarely wasted. Now, in reality, if he got that close to the enemy, something's gone wrong somewhere. Normally, he'd be way down the road behind those trees reporting back, but it does happen. You do bump into the enemy sometimes. But the key thing is, he gets the information the commander needs so he knows what he's doing when he's ready for the attack. Now, we all know the British Army is pretty busy around the world at the moment, so they've called on the tank museum to take on the Ruritania. So, here comes our M60 tank followed by our 432 with the infantry volunteers in the back. So the M60 is working its way up. And again, you rarely drive in a straight line if you're in a tank, especially if you think you're being observed by the enemy. Don't let them have the chance to aim their guns accurately at you. Ruritania is putting down fire. And the 432, if you can see the armoured personnel carrier, you can see that's pointing to where it thinks the enemy is. Well, M60's got a hit on the back of the Ruritanian tank there. It's come round the side, up the flank, and there down the field, there's our infantry about to debus or jump out the back of that vehicle. So they could have been bouncing around for the last hour or so, so they need to know where they're going. That's why you point the vehicle at where the enemy is. So our volunteers, they're putting in what's called a pepper pot or a section attack at the moment. 
And the idea there is one section runs forward at a time, followed by the other section. And they try and keep in a straight line and distance apart, not because it looks nice and neat, it's for the very practical reason you don't front, run in front of your mate and get shot up the backside. Um, they call that friendly fire, it's the most end friendly fire going. Well, we've got a bloodthirsty lot to go of our volunteers attacking the Ruritanian. Oh, look at that, pathetic. Ruritanians are thrown in the towel already. Well done, our infantry. Well done there. Now, it actually takes a fair few weeks before you do that in your phase one basic infantry training in the army, so our volunteers have literally had to pick all that up in 20 minutes before the show began, so they have actually done really very well, and they really didn't know what they were letting themselves in for. So uh, when the flag goes up on the flagpole, um, do give them a big round of applause, because they have actually uh, been very brave and very uh, foolhardy to uh, volunteer for that. That's assuming we can get the Union Jack up the flagpole. There, well done, well done. Right, so we can all sleep safely in our beds tonight. Um, Ruritanians, fear not, they will now be taken into custody. Our ride vehicle will be starting again in about 10 minutes from down the corner there. That will be running through the afternoon. And please do remember, ladies and gentlemen, your ticket is not just for today. It's for bringing that number of people back in and out of the museum over the next 12 months. There's a couple of special event days you can't use it. Just check on the website. Uh, but if you are on holiday, I hope the weather stays reasonably good for you and you have a lovely day down here at the Tank Museum. Thank you very much indeed.